All right, so I, I'm going to get started here and uh, welcome everyone. For those that don't know me, I'm Leon Gorin, CEO of PO Leadership, and welcome to the Way Forward PO Leadership's live webcast series. If you're joining us for the first time and you're a CEO, president, business owner, and or corporate executive looking to grow your leadership capabilities and performance, and of course, grow your business, you've landed in the right spot. In this rapidly changing business landscape, the importance of expanding your connections and having insightful and meaningful conversations with the right peers is now more important than ever. At PO Leadership, our members include some of Canada's strongest leaders re representing almost every industry. They lead both Canadian SMEs and large multinational organizations. Our leaders understand the value and importance of being able to connect and think with each other as they all work to successfully achieve their personal goals and those of their organization. If you're thinking about the future of your business and navigating through the many unknowns that lie ahead, if you're thinking about your stakeholders and your employees and how will you continue to engage, inspire and support them, or if you're thinking about whether and how you should pivot your business and understand the importance of being able to step outside of your building to learn from others, then I urge you to visit our website at po-leadership.com. Please set up a time to speak with us. We're more than happy to chat with you. We're here to support you, your family and your organization. So this morning, we are very excited to welcome Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. Founded in 1976, the Council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization representing the chief executives and heads of 115 leading, leading Canadian businesses. These businesses essentially represent the large caps on the TSX. They employ approximately 1.7 million Canadians. Goldie has an extensive experience as a policymaker, policy from July 2014 to October 2018, he was President and Chief Executive of Hill and Knowlton Strategies Canada. And prior to joining Hill and Knowlton, he served as a Director of Policy and Chief of Staff to the former Prime Minister, the former leader of the Federal Progressive Conservative Party, the Right Honourable Joe Clark. Mr. Hyder's understanding the ins and outs of Canadian politics at the highest levels, as well as his understanding of the implications of policy on the very organization that he now represents, gives him a unique perspective to be able to provide, provide us with an understanding of things to come. So now before I, I pass the microphone to Goldie, and what we'll probably do here is, Goldie's gonna spend about five or 10 minutes just opening us up. Then I'm gonna engage in a, in a bit of a fireside chat with him for about 15 to 20 minutes. And at the same time, what we'd like to do is open it up for questions. So as we typically do, please post your questions in the group chat. And what we'll do is I'll call you out and we'll unmute you. You can introduce yourself and then ask Goldie the question directly. So let's get started. Good morning, Goldie, and welcome to PO Leadership. We're happy you can Good join morning. us. Thanks, Leon. Great to be here. And thanks uh, to all of you who've joined uh, this uh, beautiful Friday morning. I think it's Friday. I have no idea what day it is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so let me hand it over to you for the opening and then we'll, then we'll start the chat back and forth. Great. Well, look, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for all of you being interested in uh, sort of where we are in this situation and where we're going. I want to start, though, as to where we've been a little bit. Um, you know, the thing about this virus is that we're not the lead entry into this, this situation. It's been occurring in different parts of the world. And so we should uh, look back to see, you know, in terms of, of, of how we got here. Uh, I'm learning a lot about Canada uh, in this thing. And I, and I hope we talk a little bit about that in the questions and answers, because there are ways in which I think we could have um, been better prepared. I mean, who knew that all of our PPEs were pretty much coming from somewhere else? Who knew that the only countries in the world that made swabs turned out to be China and Italy? Uh, how did we let our, you know, our stockpiles we get to virtually nothing? Uh, most of what you saw business leaders do about 10 weeks ago was try and get in front of the virus. Uh, it was our view that if you want to kill the dragon, you kill it at its head. And that would have meant extremely aggressive actions uh, on doing everything that we could have, a la New Zealand and a variety of other countries, Taiwan and so forth, to, to mitigate this risk by acting tough because we knew the virus was coming. But I think there was a certain sense of Canadian um, confidence, some would say uh, cockiness or smugness these days, that somehow it was going to behave differently in Canada and that we should you know, allow the provinces and the mayors and everybody to do whatever it is that they pretty much wanted to do across the country which is unfortunate because I think it created uh, you know, more, more um, uh, risk than was necessary. Having said that, certainly we've done a better job in managing 
the virus than a variety of other countries, and some very close to us, if I can say without using any names, uh, you know, clearly we've done, we've done a better job. I think the, the thing that really drove the business community was the health considerations. It all happened about 10 weeks ago and on a weekend, I started getting calls from several CEOs, many of whom were bank CEOs and saying, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get out there Goldie and tell people to shut the economy down. And I'm like, I'm sorry, is, who's this? Because it's not normal for a business to come out there and say, shut the economy down. But they all came from their hospital boards and their foundations that they sit on. And that weekend just happened to be a bunch of board meetings. And what the medical professional said to them was, um, our healthcare system is going to experience an, a tsunami like no other. Doctors are going to be put into a position of, of moral choice of you know, who gets a ventilator or not. And we have to stop that from happening. And the only way to stop that from happening is to get really aggressive in, in the spread. And so we took what I would say was a pretty bold, courageous decision to get out in front of government and actually give them some cover and had 100 CEOs sign a letter in three national newspapers, including in French, and basically said, shut the economy down. Now, we had thought that that was a, and we still think it is a short-term pain for long-term gain strategy, and there's no question there's been a lot of pain. And I think to give government full marks, and uh, you know, I, I think they moved at record speeds for government uh, to get out the programs, to, to, get them, to get them in place, and we can debate whether they were the right programs, whether the approach was right or wrong, and I've got points of view on that. But overall, government moved at record pace, and, and let's be clear, none of them signed up for this either. This is um, unprecedented for them, and they are doing the best that they, that they can for what they think is the best in the national interest. So I, I think how we got here is important. It was a healthcare emergency. It remains a healthcare emergency. I know you want to talk about the economy and, and so forth. This is an exogenous threat, and we will be in this situation until we deal with the healthcare uh, situation. So I'd love to get into that in terms of the restart. Uh, sorry, in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, the restart, where we are. This is where our focus has been now as business leaders. Uh, we now need to pivot to uh, what I would say is life with COVID or coexisting with COVID. The, the reality is there's a very long road ahead here. I don't want to burst people's bubbles with the excitement about there's a vaccine and this is going on and that's going on. Not, not how this works. <laughs> this is going to take a long time. It could be one year, two years, three years. We don't really know. Right? It's, I'm starting to think that it's more likely we're going to get treatments than we are a vaccine so that people don't actually die and they don't actually have to suffer the way that you, you suffer uh, in this at the, at the tail end of, of what you experience. Um, it's possible that treatment emerges uh, before the, the vaccine uh, itself does. It, we think that for a responsible restart of the economy to occur, a number of things need to take place. First and foremost, and this is an area where Canada is sadly lacking, uh, and it is our testing, tracking, and tracing capabilities. If we can't increase dramatically our capacity to test, track, and trace, uh, we are not going to be able to get the public confidence that's necessary. The second part of it is the, the, the need for PPEs. You know, the, the, again, who knew that you, we don't make hardly any of the stuff uh, that we need. Now, the good news is this is creating a scenario in which we can. Uh, industrial response to this has just been phenomenal. You look at many of the CEOs that I represent, Magna, Linamar, you know, Martin Ray, Suncor, Canada Goose, DAE, all of these companies, and I've got a long list on our website of all the things that companies are doing to pivot their capacity to make things, to make the things that we need right now. In fact, I would say to you, we're probably gonna have more ventilators than we need when this is all over. So we have the capacity to be warlike response from industry, but it doesn't have to be that way. I think we have to think very smartly and strategically, and I know you wanna talk about the future uh, as well. Let's talk about how we, what lessons do we learn uh, from where we are? The other component that we're extremely focused on right now now is the need for public confidence. You know, just think about it. What we have said to society, uh, governments have said to society, and what we've said to you is, uh, for the last 10 weeks, uh, there's a virus, it's really dangerous, please stay inside. And now what we're saying to Canadians and others is, uh, there's a virus, uh, it remains dangerous, but please come outside. And so you can uh, appreciate why poll after poll after poll it continues to show a very high degree of anxiousness and anxiety uh, on the part of Canadians. And I'll, I've been out 10 times in 10 weeks. I go basically to grocery when I can. And I think on two occasions, we've done takeout. It's a slow journey back. And I, and I used my, uh, I happen to look at a pool all the time out here, but I look at my pool and I think to myself, in many ways, what we said to people 10 weeks ago is get out of the pool. There's something in the pool. We don't know what the heck it is. Just everybody get out. 
And so everybody got out and they're sitting on their lounge chairs. They're wondering when the lifeguard will say it's okay to go back in. And now the lifeguard's saying it's okay to go back in. And, but he's saying, here, put on these water rings, take this floater, take this, you know, shez, whatever, but like floaty, um, because it's not entirely safe in the pool. So don't jump in the deep end just yet. Maybe start with the steps in your shallow end and slowly tiptoe your way back to re-engage with, in this case, the pool and the analogy in the society so that we can start thinking about how do we get back to the temporary new normal that we're going to be in so long as we're coexisting with COVID because the threat remains real. Um, I, I just did an op-ed with another doctor, uh, not another doctor, I'm not one, but a doctor to talk about how um, you know, the, 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 the behaviors that we need in society are going to be shaped by the confidence that we have in our healthcare system. So, you know, people are not going to flock back to restaurants today. They're not going to go to a, you know, a Leafs game or, or whatever uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's, no, there's just not a, a pent up desire to say, I want all of my life back. People want their life back as much of it as they can get, but they're scared. And so we have to do something about the public confidence question. And we've been focusing it on that. The third piece, um, which uh, we can discuss as well, is the recovery piece, right? Because the, 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 the restart is very different than the recovery. The longer term recovery is something that uh, I hope we learn the lessons of what we've just been through. I, I often say that if we want to honor the lives of those lost, we need to make life better for those that lived. And that means learning uh, from this process uh, about ourselves as businesses, as governments, uh, as society, what can we do better and, and what is the lessons that needs to come out of this? Like, how is it that the long-term care centers got into the situation that they have, you know? We, we really have to think through some of those things. Um, how frustrating has it been for businesses to see that Canada is not one country, but 13, in some cases, even more, because cities are creating their own rules. So when you're a national business, it's very frustrating to be told that you're an essential service in one province, but a non-essential service in another. How does that work? You know, you have supply chains that get disrupted here. You have labor issues that get disrupted here. So there's a lot of that going on. And then last but not least, I think we have to look at the the social uh, impact of this on society as well. I mean, we, we're, you know, we were getting ready in April to have a meeting uh, on the climate and the you know, growth strategy and in terms of how do you do clean growth, um, you know, but we also need to now look at infrastructure spending. Let's not be small ball about it. Let's think big about infrastructure, you know. Let's really get hungry and aggressive as a country to want to compete globally because Things are going to change. Um, I will just end by saying that my master's thesis 30 some odd years ago was actually about policy making in times of crisis. And so a couple of things I recall from its conclusion were, first of all, it's usually a really bad time to make policies in a crisis because you get, you know, you're in the, of the moment and you end up making policies for the exception rather than the rule. So I would caution everybody from wholesale changes for, you know, your business protocols or government regulations. Don't make dramatic changes in a crisis. Let the thing settle. The second learning, which I think is very appropriate here, is that a lot of people are predicting a lot of things that are going to forever change. And what history shows is that it's uh, human nature to say that in a crisis. But let me tell you what else is human nature. The pendulum goes hard one way and it goes hard the other way. But over time, people come back to being people. We are going to fly again. We're going to take cruises again. We're going to go to sporting events again. We're going to go to restaurants. We're going to have people over at our house. It's just, it, you know, so all this notion of, you know, telework and telehealth and telemedicine and telelearning. Yep, there's going to be a bunch of things that are going to happen around that for sure. But in the long run, the, the, the tendency is ironically to come back to, you know, what, what, what we as human beings value, which is social uh, is social interaction. So on that positive note, let me uh, end there, Leon. I hope that overview is helpful for our Q&A. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Goldie, for that. So let me, um, let's jump into the restart, just for everybody's not, I've broken up into restart. I want to talk a little bit about the recession. I want to talk about some future government policies here, but you, you talk about being able to coexist, and I totally agree. It's absolutely critical. So let's talk quickly about tracking, testing, and tracing. Um, why where are we in that? And, you know, yesterday, for example, I watch, you watch CTV News, Ontario and Quebec falling short on this stuff. How does, how do we get, come up to speed? What's holding us back here on getting that right? Yeah, I mean, again, we were ill-prepared. Uh, and that's, that's the big issue here, right? Because what the lessons of the rest of the world are showing us is if you can test, track and trace, you can contain the virus. You know, South Korea, I've just seen some statistics this morning on South Korea, Taiwan. You know, they've been very effective. Uh, in South Korea, never even shut down its economy. Shut, South Korea kept its economy open, and but used testing, tracking, and tracing, widespread uh, testing, tracking, and tracing. 
uh, to be there. I mean, look, we are 10 weeks into this thing um, and we're still working on an app. We're still working on an app to get Canadians so that they can be tracked and traced, you know, and we have to address the privacy issues around all that for sure. But let's get on with it. And I think that this is one of those um, uh, lessons for us culturally as a nation is we're really slow. We're really comfortable. We're really complacent. We, we just take our time. And, and the virus, it, you know, doesn't respect that. In fact, I think the virus preys on that. And so we have to dramatically ramp that up. And, and by the way, we in business, I just had a call with about 132 of our CEOs for a couple of hours uh, just the day before yesterday. And one of their main messages was, you know, what are we going to do on testing? And then what are we as business, what can we do as businesses? Because as I said earlier, we responded to the PPE requirements. There's a lot of stuff that we're able to do for, for PPEs now. Um, but even there, it's a globally competitive market. Uh, it's very challenging. I'll give you an example on the testing. One of my members purchased 50,000 tests for another uh, country uh, in which they operate, where they have over 20,000 employees and they wanted to use testing as, as a way to get back to work, paid for the tests and everything. And when they went to the storage locker where they all were, they're gone. I mean, tests have become the new heroin of the, of the international marketplace. And so it's very important that we start innovating on what testing could be as well. There's a local company here in Ottawa called Spartan that launched it. But, you know, they were an R&D company of, that, that could make a thousand of these tests. We need a million of these tests. We need 10 million of these tests. We should be testing at ex exponentially higher levels than we are today. And that means making sure that we're continuing to find a way to do that testing because uh, without it, I think public confidence is going to continue to lack. And as I said, on the tracking and tracing piece, we haven't even produced an app. I know that I've downloaded one from the province of Alberta, which was actually done by uh, uh, Deloitte. Uh, so you can actually download it now. And, uh, and, and at least you know that if you're out and about and you come across somebody, someone's hopefully going to reach out to you and say, hey, you should quarantine yourself because, you know, that guy that you were in line with in the, in the Best Buy, Turned out he tested positive or whatever the case might be. So we're behind. We need to put a hurry up offense into this thing. I think government here really needs to partner um, much more with industry uh, to, to help you know, work together on solving this problem because without it, uh, I don't think public confidence is gonna, is gonna return to the levels that we need it to return. So Goldie, do you think it's an issue of uh, supply when we talk about tracking and testing or is it an issue of I don't want to say leadership, but in terms, you're right, it's been only 10 weeks, but getting the processes down pat and the communication properly done. It's, you know, I come back to Ontario and Quebec, because when you look across the country, there's a huge difference in performance today in terms of how different provinces are handling this. And, and, I, and, and I, I, I'm sort of needling you on this because without that, I, don't, I think it becomes very difficult to get back to work, as, as you talk about. Yeah, we agree. Um, we agree. And I think that, look, this is the, the, the um, uh, conundrum and, and challenge of being a federation, right? I mean, healthcare is, a, is pretty much a jurisdiction for the, for the provincial governments to do. So we are seeing, you know, um, uh, episodic responses uh, in terms of how provinces are managing their health care. Uh, look, I recognize that Canada is a complicated place to govern. It's hard to govern. I, I get that. Uh, but in a crisis, you would think that we could really benefit from really strong national leadership that helps pull people together and create a common. I'll give you a, an analogy that I think frustrated many Canadians and it certainly frustrated uh, people that I speak with is just, just on healthcare. Inconsistencies on is a mask a good idea or a bad idea? My members will tell you that because many of them have already been. And it's the other thing. I think that one of the things that's not occurred that should occur more is talk to the people who've already dealt with the virus somewhere else. So if you're, you know, Manulife or Sun Life or a CIBC or a BMO or a Linamar or a tech, we all my member companies have been not all. A lot of my member companies have already gone through this for the last three months in advance. They've seen the startup, they've seen the mitigation. In some cases, you know, the consulting companies, PwC and others were telling me that they're 80% back to work in China. You know, they've got protocols in place and you get four into an elevator and everybody faces a wall as you go up and down, but, but processes are back and people are, are functioning. But we couldn't even decide whether masks is a good idea or a bad idea. And you know what they do in Asia? They wear masks. <laughs> it just helps to prevent the spread. You know, now I don't want to legislate and litigate that, but I mean, like, just like let people, you know, um, and I think we as people have a duty here. And I don't want to make this clear. I am not here saying it's all of government. In fact, I'm saying it's on all of us. Who, who we are as a people, how we're governed, what we're trying to do is a responsibility of government. Government has a role on the healthcare side, the testing, the tracking, the tracing, you know, the procurement of PPEs and so forth, and 
business certainly can can help with that, a number a number of those things. They also have a very important role, not only in the confidence of our healthcare system, but in the conf confidence of our public transport. You know, we're going to restart an economy here. My big big concern about a restart is what happens if you restart the economy and very few people show up. Um, and one of the reasons is people are scared to get on a bus or on a subway or, or or be in public places or walk through a path or take a plus fifteen in Calgary. You know, like this is what we have to address, and that's up to governments to do a lot of that. Businesses need to do everything that they can to, um, to do what you and everybody on this call would know. Our number one issue is always the health and safety and well-being of our employees uh, and, th and those who visit our premises in terms of our customers and consumers and, and, you know, and, and other stakeholders. So that's, that's happening. I have seen playbooks. I have seen videos, 200 pages of, of, of books telling you know, uh, how the GM plant is going to be run or how Lindemar is going to have its operations. Like They're doing all the fiduciary duty things that you would expect of big companies. We also need to support small companies, and that's where we're actually focused on a program that we hope to launch that really um, builds some, some, some capacity and confidence in our SMEs to succeed because we can't afford the supply chain disruption. But there's also a personal responsibility here, right? I mean, you know, when I do go out and see, I'd say I see like a handful of people wearing a mask. Um, you know, I don't know how many people go home and wash their hands. And, you know, if you wash your hands 10 times a day, you've reduced the risk of getting the virus by 50%. Do people do that? I don't know. Uh, you know, are we acting as responsibly as we should? You know, I, I know we're not American about it. We're not taking our guns and going down to the beach, but I still see a lot of people congregating. I don't see our police officers, uh, you know, wearing masks. I, like, I, I think that we need our leaders to set the example uh, and, and show people that if we are going to coexist with COVID, it's going to require us to be very disciplined and responsible and mature uh, about the way we do this because the worst thing that can happen, Leon, the worst thing that can happen here is a second shutdown. So whether that happens because the health explodes, uh, the health virus or the virus explodes, or businesses shut down because they couldn't make a go of it, right? If that happens, I think it's catastrophic psychologically, and it certainly is economically. Well, we already heard from Trump, eh? there's going to be no, you, you can hear one thing from Trump in the next year or another, but he was adamant about there will not be a second shutdown. Now, he doesn't necessarily control it. It's controlled locally. But yep. in, in the companies that you're dealing with, and, and you're right, we, we, each one will have these best practices in place. Are any of them talking about a potential second shutdown, like another wave and how they would sort of get through that? Or are they based uh, look, I, 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 I think that 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 um, one of the other great traits of being Canadian, the positive side is, is we're, we're eternal optimists. And right. I think that you know my membership, my membership, and myself, and many others are all of the view that we can do this, we okay. can do this, like we can get through this. But it requires you to have some of that honest conversations that I'm having with you. Uh, you know, it's easy for me. I'm not going door to door for my job in the next campaign. But I think we need to be clear with Canadians. But we also need to start the narrative pivoting from you know be scared to be safe, be alert. I, I have a, a sort of a tongue in cheek slogan that I've been using, which is make Canada safe again. <laughs> like what we need to do is remind people that safety begins at home. And that means people are going to, it's going to be like an, un, a layer of an onion, right? They're going to say, okay, if I'm safe at home, I'm going to stay here. But if the next layer of my onion, which is my community, you know, the neighborhood that I live in, if that's safe, I'll go out into that place. But if the, you know, the next area is I should go downtown. Okay. Then I guess I can go downtown as well. Oh, maybe I can visit another city in my province. Oh, maybe I can visit another province. I think as we gradually build confidence across the country, remember this is a, at least two years. I think we're into this for at least two years. So Canadians are, 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 are going to want to see the path uh, to, to, to returning to, um, you know, this new environment in which we are. And, and everything that we can do to create that confidence is really, really essential at this time. So that, you, you just uh, sort of answered my question. I mean, the V, the V versus the U, and I, I agree with you. I mean, you say two There's years. no V for starters. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, there's no V. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a lot of chatter. This is going to be really three years at a minimum. This is something obviously on the I'm economic side for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, in, in, and this is useful to a lot of leaders in the room, of the 150 leaders that you're talking to, what are some of the key things that they're doing to prepare for a recession in the last three years? And we don't know the extent of it, but you know, let's talk jobs, for example. A lot of them had, there were some opportunities to subsidize jobs, people furloughed individuals. Are they bringing these people back? You know, we heard Hair Canada now going to lay off 20,000. What are you hearing among your members today? Yeah. Well, let's, let's, 
so let's just separate the the distressed uh, companies from the right. rest, right? Because I think that um, you know I'm fairly fortunate, and the people that I represent, for the most part, have weathered this storm, right? They had the balance sheets to do it. Uh, they had the leadership that, that made the decisive uh, actions uh, to, to, to do that, to, uh, you know, and protect. I have many members, actually, who just continued payroll without any work for anybody because they could. They thought it was the right thing to do. They didn't use government programs to do it. They're quietly doing it. Many of them are private companies. Um, and they're just, you know, doing what they think is best for, for that. Now, let's be honest, that, that runway has its limits. We can't, you know, people right. cannot do that uh, forever, which is why this restart is so important and why the, the, the need for the restart to be successful is so important. Those distressed companies, however, are in a totally different place. So when I talk to a Kale and Revenescu or an Ed Sims at WestJet or, you know, uh, Steve Samet at Rocky Mountaineer or take any one of the energy companies who are experiencing a double, triple whammy, you know, their, their needs are different. Right, because in the case of the, the tourism industry and the airline industry, it is government imposed policy that has actually led to their decline. Right, and, and, and the government imposed policy we support. It, it, we have supported over the course of the last 10 weeks. I think we have to expand and the opening up now uh, as we get ready for summer and, and beyond. We, we can't keep our border closed for three years. We can't keep our airspace closed for three years. We do need to give these companies and Canadians and, and others to, a chance to get back to uh, some semblance of, of life, um, which includes perhaps visiting your family in the United States or in the UK or wherever else they might be in the world. Um, those, those companies are, are a challenge because it's a policies. And so governments need to be there to support them because it's your policies, which we support, <laughs> has triggered the problem. But you have to ask yourself, is, is Canada okay without its own airline? Like, are you okay with nowhere Air Canada, nowhere WestJet, or, you know, use American Airlines or Qatar Air or something else? No, I think we would like to have, uh, you know, Canadian control of our airline industry so we can compete in a global marketplace, which we do very well, uh, as does Air Canada, and, and then more recently WestJet in some way, their expanded international travel. The, the rest of the companies are, are focused on a number of things. Uh, as I said, we just had a call. Um, no particular order here, but, but there is a lot of um, thought leadership being put into how has work really changed, right? Um, you know, I know that, that building owners and others at first were concerned that, you know, well, if people can work from home, I guess your people are going to come back and renegotiate their leases and take away less space and stuff. Actually, that may not happen. What's happening now is all those companies that did this, you know, we want, you know, the creativity that, that a hub creates and we want you all to sit three feet apart in a cubicle. Well, that's probably not on for the long run, right? Like we may be returning to the office era, in which case people are actually going to need perhaps more space or reconfigured space. But there's also a number of businesses who said, you know what, I, I want to give my workers a lot of flexibility. I think Shopify is at the extreme and Twitter might be at the extreme, but a lot of businesses are saying, do I really need my accounting team in my office every day? Do I need three floors of accountants in an energy company building that I own? You know, like, why can't I just let them do whatever it is that they do, wherever it is that they do it, and just get me the outcome that I need in a timely way? So I think you're going to see more, uh, more of that. I think that what this uh, virus has done has actually... Uh, accelerated digital transformation for SMEs in particular. So yes, a lot of businesses are not going to make it, but a lot of businesses are also going to reappear and they're going to come back in a, in a digital form because they're going to realize that, that the bricks and mortar really was, uh, was punitive on them in terms of carrying debt and, uh, and, and having to finance those things. And, and so I think you're going to see an accelerated digital transformation. And, and I know that that's painful for some um, and it's unfortunate, but, but the reality is, is that we, we do live in a period of constant change, you know, and only those who are constantly morphing, constantly adapting, constantly thinking about what's coming are going to survive uh, in what is a very, you know, flat, flat uh, you know, world in, in which we live. So I don't think any of that's changed. Members are also thinking about the global uh, consequences of what's taking place, right? I mean, as I said, there'll be a lot of concern about how vulnerable we were to have our PPEs and other things being provided basically from a country or two. So you're going to want to see more production of key things that I think that industry can be responsive to. We're monitoring our supply chains, you know. Um, I, I would caution everybody who's out there saying, well, that's it, we all got to get out of China. We to... Again, what history has shown is a society of 5,000 years like they are, they're going to survive, they're going to be just fine. 
what, what we need is an and strategy. We used to have a China uh, and a US strategy, and we said well, we better go out and do uh, diversifying. We did China, you know, and Asia a bit. I think what we need to do is an and strategy. So we need to think first and foremost back to the home, what I call uh, can we strengthen the neighborhood, right? So the neighborhood is Canada, US, Mexico. We actually have a free trade agreement that, that's been put in place that has a clause in it on competitiveness to make North America competitive. And we saw how quickly uh, the 3M episode where the president tried to say, you can't send masks to Canada, Mexico, he had to blink, you know, because we are a continental trade uh, trading zone here. So we have to strengthen that. We can take that deeper down South and start thinking it's a long run here, but you got to start cultivating democracies and start cultivating systems that have a, 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 a educated workforce and, and, you know, and, and labor capacity um, so that we can strengthen this neighborhood but we're not going to leave Asia. We are not going to leave Asia. We, I mean, the demographics are just too good. The opportunities are too good. Many companies, in the case of one of my companies, has been in China longer than Canada has been in existence. So we're not going to just pack up and leave China or Japan or you know or Korea or, or you know any of these other places, Vietnam, Thailand, anytime soon. I think what we have to do is continue the path of diversification, diversify with you know this TPP, diversify with CETA. Um, we cannot be a country that is not pro-trade, pro-investment, and pro-immigration. It's over for Canada if we're against those things. No, that's great. So I, I'm going to open up a question. The, the last thing I want to just touch with you on, and it, you may even come in a question too, but is future government policies. I, you, you may have some insight on some of that stuff, and, and I'll be pointed about it. I mean, we are printing money, which is, makes a lot of sense. And you got this is like I said, unprecedented. We need to print money. We need to keep consumer confidence up. They're the drivers of the economy and we need to keep people employed somehow. At some point in time, the taps have to turn off um, because our currency is going to go down to the bottom here. And, uh, and the U.S. is, you're already starting to see that in the center in the U.S. They are already starting to push back on some of the stuff. How are we going to, you know, a couple of things. One is universal income is now question is, will it continue on forever now? And two is, as Canadians and future generations, how are we going to pay for all this stuff? Do you, any insights? Is it going to be corporate through corporate taxes? Is it going to hit us personally? Or is it going to come through potentially an HST increase? Do you have any insights on that stuff through conversations? All right. So a lot there to, a lot there to unpack. Um, look, here's the danger of the situation in which we find ourselves. Hi. I'm from the government. I have a program for you. <laughs> That's basically the world in which we're living today. I dread 1115 on my clock every day because I know that several hundred million dollars, if not billions of dollars, is going to be announced. We were 10 weeks into this thing. I mean, I don't think we need, uh, John Iverson wrote about this the other day in the National Post. I, 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 when we're getting down to talking about whether the CFL deserves $150 million, I'm sorry, we're going, we're going far <laughs> in terms of what this crisis was about, right? And so let's not lose track here of government being uh, essentially a bank and, and, and making uh, you know, uh, programs and cash available limitlessly. And I, I am all for helping those who needed the help, the jobs, uh, particularly the people who lost jobs due to COVID, investing in our healthcare system and, and, and so forth. But we have got to pivot. We have got to get out of that idea that we have now conditioned the public for, which is whatever problem you got, the government's got a program for you. And if they don't, just yell and scream and you'll get one, right? And, and that's not the way forward. So that has to end. Um, we need to wean people off the idea that these programs are eternal, right? And I think that the, 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 the language that our political leaders use really matters as we pivot into this restart moment, right? Which is, you know, the Prime Minister announced, uh, I think, early that he's going to be extending the, the wage subsidy program because that may just tell a bunch of people, oh, I think I can stay home for two more months because I'm scared to go out, right? And, and I know his intention was to say to people, hire people back and get them back to work. And, and I agree with him. That's exactly what we should be doing. And, 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 in, and in order to do that, I think we have to create that confidence so we're, we come back full circle to where I was. Um, so we ha cannot have that government knows best and government has a program for everything model. That has to stop because otherwise that deficit and that debt is just going to run away. And while it's a, you know, zero interest environment and a low inflation environment, we all know that's cyclical. Someday it won't be. And then we'll be in like 1993, uh, Paul Martin had to do, and we'll be cutting, 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 cutting. And so I think that has to change. I would also say that we need to, um, um, you know, 
before we go to the tax model, which will be uh, potentially a response uh, by government, both personal taxes, corporate taxes, uh, and consumption taxes. Um, I would favor consumption taxes out of all of those, by the way. Um, we, need to sh we need to also have um, a, a growth strategy for Canada. We need to return to where we were before this virus happened, but we need to do it with far greater urgency. We had released a task force report available on our website. I would say everything we talked about last October is as relevant, if not more relevant, as we get ready to recover in our economy. Um, you know, uh, to, to think about the future of our economy, uh, to think about the investments that are necessary. For the last 10 weeks, we've had a stimulus program that's been about job preservation, largely. As you look ahead, we're going to need a stimulus program on job creation. Uh, and, and I think we need to look at it, uh, you know, I, I, I'm doing a lot of thought leadership outreach because um, I'm not that smart. I talk to a lot of smart people and they give you some good ideas. I talked to Paul Martin yesterday and, uh, and I guess we did before yesterday, we had a good 45 minute chat and he said, you know, when he was finance minister, what he would say to his ministers is you want an infrastructure project? I want a ratio of, of a dollar going in and a $10 value coming back out the other end. So it's not a dollar today, it is a dollar today. We, we have to think strategically and long-term and that requires our political leaders at every level to get past the, you know, the, the short-term thinking of the next election. It, I know it's hard to do, but we really need to think about, is there a moment here where we can really transform our, ourselves? Like, can we build high-speed rail finally? You know, can, we, can we do some things that are in the long-term interests of our country? Because that's the, what the countries that are beating us today do. Japan, Korea, you know, China, uh, Vietnam, and others that are catching up and, and really pushing us, they move quick. So we need to have a much more aggressive competitiveness strategy as it relates. And, 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 I, and I think that, that over time, um, you know, the deficit and the debt can be, can be tackled. I don't, I'm not out here saying, you know, we've got to put all the focus on the deficit today, but we do need to have a plan of how we're going to pay it down uh, and, and chip away at the debt because we're now no longer about worried about what you're going to pay or what my kids are going to pay. We're at the grandchildren now. So, you know, I, I hope that we feel guilty if we're going to leave them behind, you know, unnecessarily with a lot of deficit and debt. We should do a better job of cleaning that up. Hi, I'm Leon Gorin, president of PEO Leadership, a peer-to-peer -peer leadership advisory firm. We're an amazing community of CEOs, presidents, and senior executives. Ask yourself, are you learning as fast as the world is changing? It's time for Ontario business leaders to band together for counsel and support. It's time for you to tap into the business wisdom of our peer groups and unlock new ways to grow. I want you to come out of this COVID crisis a better leader and your organization ready for what's next. Take the first step at peo-leadership.com. All right, let's go to some questions here. Uh, Melanie Heenan, if you want to come off mute and uh, ask your question, it'd be great. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can. Okay, so um, a big concern, and, and particularly I have four daughters in the same business, and there's no childcare. So how does the economy get going again, and particularly for women, without childcare? I'm so glad you raised that, Melanie. I, I'm, I have three daughters, so you won't up me on that one. But uh, it, it is, it is um, one of the opportunities that I think could come. If you're going to spend $300 billion, childcare would have been a fraction of that cost, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Pharmacare would have been a fraction of that cost. Digitally connecting all Canadians would have been a fraction of that cost, right? So if we're going to spend that kind of money, let's do it for the kinds of things that are going to actually be transformative. So back to Mr. Martin, a dollar needs to buy me 10. So childcare is a great example of a program where a dollar invested in the childcare system could get you $10 of return on productivity. It's worth the investment. And so I think as we pivot to this, and there is going to be more spending, my concern is, is we're going to start getting, you know, back to the politics of the moment, everyone's going to have their pet projects and their mayors and the, whom I'm actually on within 20 minutes here are going to talk about repairs that are necessary to pipes and all that. Yeah, that's all fine, but we need to be more ambitious. And I, and, and you know, we had uh, Minister McKenna 
uh, on our on our call with our with our CEOs, and uh, you know she was she was really good in talking about as was uh, Mr. Sabia on the need for creativity, the need to challenge ourselves, the need to be thinking longer term, the need to change uh, to, to to look at the way we do P threes. You know, there's a lot of models out there that doesn't necessarily mean government has to do anything, and I think in areas like childcare, pharma care, and other things, including infrastructure, those are tremendous opportunities. I think to go big or go home. Let's do the things that we talked about. The field is littered in politics with everybody who's promised us childcare in election after election after election. Yeah. Right. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, and I, and I encourage, you know, people, uh, you know, on this call and others to, to talk about that in your, in your discussions with, with your own leaders so that, that there's this cascading effect. And when the political people start hearing the same thing from different corners, they go, oh, yeah, I like that idea. Let's do that one. Yeah. Well, for sure. I think, there needs to be a national daycare because you can't like in Ontario, it's $2,000 per month for a child. And in, in Quebec, it's 200 or 300, you know, you can't, you just can't operate like that as, as I said, particularly women. And so if women are going back to work, I mean, I'm a, I'm also part of the business, but right now I am chief childcare. Yeah. Know? Yeah. You're trying to read. I think, I think that's a great, a great point. And one of the other folks I was talking to uh, yesterday was uh, Jean Charest, and he was talking about it, this issue, but also saying, you know, when you talk about one province has this rule and one another province having that rule, labor mobility, labor mobility would be, you know, enabled perhaps by childcare, right? Like people would be able to say, oh, I can actually go, right. you know, uh, across the, you know, a longer drive to go to the job that I want to do in Montreal instead of being in Ottawa or whatever the case might be. So there are a number of these conversations that need to be had. I will just say that um, our public servants are doing a, a, you know, an outstanding job, uh, in not only mitigating this, this crisis and providing advice and counsel, some of which is, is taken and some of which is not, and certainly the prerogative of the political folks, but we need smart, smart people working together to give our political leaders the direction and the, and the guidance and the advice that they need, because um, you know, they don't necessarily know um, uh, what they don't know, uh, particularly about business. There's not a lot of people that are running from business uh, in public life these days. And can you blame them given what, what political life has become? Uh, and so we need to be uh, strong in our communications publicly about what we want and, and creating the conditions in which political leaders at all levels of government can bring that about. Okay. Thank, thanks, uh, Melanie, for the question. Mike, I'd like Mike Welling, if you can come off mute, you got a couple of questions. Maybe grab one of them, Mike. Um, okay. Um, Goldie, do you think one of the opportunities, they say never waste a good crisis. One of the things that has been discussed on and off for years with little progress is the whole thing about interprovincial trade barriers. Do you see this crisis as being one that actually, you know, with all the noise about uh, the U.S. becoming a less reliable trade partner, China becoming a less reliable trade partner, a less attractive place for investment and so on. Do you see something finally happening on that? Great question. Uh, you picked on a personal pet peeve of mine because it drives me crazy that we're a pro-trade nation, pro-free trade nation, just not inside Canada. <laughs> so it's, it's really absurd uh, that that happens. Uh, interestingly enough, that is a, a big part of the push that we are making uh, with our conversations with premiers and others to say, you know what, enough is enough. Just bring bloody things down because there are, uh, by estimates of the Bank of Canada and others, about 4% of GDP, 4% of GDP in a virtually zero growth environment that is trapped inside those interprovincial trade barriers. And so they've got to come down. But my worry is, um, based on what I've seen and what I've observed, what I've commented on here, is this whole experience is reinforcing the idea of many Canadas. There have been two very good pieces written about that. Susan Delacourt in the Toronto Star wrote about it about a month ago or so saying, who speaks for Canada? And ironically, with almost the exact same headline, Who Speaks for Canada was in the National Post with Andrew Potter about two days ago, I believe it was. And so we're, we're going to have to, as Canadians, we're going to have to say, you know what? Um, it's unacceptable to me that I can't, you know, that, 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 that um, you know, I, I can't, you know, usual example, I can't get a bottle of wine from BC and bring it to Alberta, or what's a truck in BC is a van in Alberta, but is an 18-wheeler in Saskatchewan. It's absurd. I applaud Jason Kenney, Premier of Alberta, who's just said, I'm bringing them down in Alberta. And I know Premier Ford and I have talked about this as well. And he's very keen on doing some stuff with Saskatchewan. And they're going to build some momentum. 
Um, it's a provincial, it's, it's a provincial, you know, um, burden to some extent, the federal government can certainly push it. My message to the federal government has been, you know, when the provinces come to you with handouts for money, why don't you tell them that they should bring the interprovincial trade barriers down before you give them another dime, because they're the ones who are holding up the money that we need to be able to pay them. So I'm going to be pushing very hard for it, Mike, and I know a lot of others that are, and uh, I, I'm not dodging your question. I think they will come down. I just don't think we'll be as fast as you and I might like it, because in my opinion, they should be down tomorrow morning. I just hope that the premiers, as they all face their fiscal crises and are looking for ways to say, how do we get some advantage that they start to be a little more cooperative? Yeah, but it's all about territoriality, right? I mean, you take a look at the, um, as the national securities regulator. We don't have one. India, a country of a billion people, has one national security regulator. Canada has 13, because you know what? PEI really needs its own, <laughs> right? I mean, why? It's just absurd that, that we have that situation. And so I'm hoping, as I said, that we don't let this crisis, uh, particularly in the name of those who've died, you know, let's make life better uh, so for those that lived and address these long-standing irritants um, that are, by the way, all self-made. We love to blame Donald Trump for things or, you know, the United Nations for things or some China for things. These are all our own thing. We, we do this to ourselves. And so it's got to stop. Thanks, Mike, for the question. Adam Silver, you've got a question. Adam? All right, maybe we've lost Adam. Get mute. I, I, yeah, he may be on mute. Um, Okay, I'll come back to him. Dave Douglas, I'll go to you. Did I lose Dave Douglas too? I may have lost Dave Douglas. I, sorry about that. Uh, on mute. Um, yeah, and, and well, thank you, Leon. And actually, Leon, you led off with the very question that I asked was just how the government is going to reconcile this uh, probably many year decline in tax revenues with the um, uh, with the absolutely incredible increase in expenditures that we're going to see now and over the few years. And you answer the question very well, but um, you know, is, is that what you think the government is, is thinking right now? Have they had discussions on where they're going to go with tax policy and, uh, and, and su such? I've got no. really <laughs> answer, but no. It's, it's not happened. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say, well, look, in fairness, there are 724 on the, the, the current moment. Uh, I remember when I spoke with Mr. Monroe about 10 weeks ago, I said, you know, Bill, you're like, we should probably have 12 to 15 prominent Canadians who understand how the world works and how the economy works. Take them into a room and tell them that, look, change your calendars to January 1, 2021. Um, you're going to come to them and you're going to ask them for uh, advice on the next main budget, let's say hypothetically it's in February of next year, just just have put them aside somewhere. And you know, again, it's, it, it, it's, it's easy for me to say, it, it, I don't think it's happened. In fact, I'm pretty sure it hasn't happened. We're starting to think about some of those things and launching it our, ourselves. And I've been part of my outreach, as I just mentioned, you know, talking to Ed Clark, all kinds of people has been about, um, you know, um, you know, Annette Verisher and people have been reaching out to saying, what would you do? What would you do if you were tasked with, with you know, helping us with a recovery? Not imminently, like it's, I'm not saying do it today, tomorrow, but how do we get ready for that? And, and I think a lot more of that could just be coming from business and we're certainly gonna be, we're gonna be pushing for that. I also think that the questions that, that, you know, that have come up, we need to be careful what we wish for, right? Because the reality is there are limits on the personal tax side and on the corporate tax side. Uh, the world is still full of lots of options for people and for businesses. We compete aggressively around the world to recruit the smartest talent that we can. Um, and they do pay attention to your tax policies, right? And so if we're gonna like, you know, I'm at 53 and a half percent in Ontario, I think it's the highest, and you're gonna go to like, you know, 55, 56, 55, I think in New Brunswick's 58. Like we're getting to levels where people are not gonna come. So we have to be careful not to drive, uh, to restrict that talent from coming in and to encourage talent to leave, that would be bad. I also think we have to be careful on the corporate tax side and we have to be careful to create that, that divide that is so commonly put out there, right? Big business versus small business, big business versus labor, you know, the CEOs versus everybody else. Like, let's grow up, you know, let's have an adult conversation in Canada about what it means to build our economy and, and, and really uh, focus in on a growth strategy for the country, you know, deregulate 
inflation on things where we, again, have been our own worst enemy. I mean, we're a laughing stock of the world that we have natural resources up our yin yang, and we don't have the capacity to get them out of our shores without sending them into the United States. Absurd, right? And so we really need to do that. I go to Japan and they say, we would build 20 LNG facilities in Canada, but we don't know if you'd ever approve any of them. So we're going to other places. Like that stuff has got to stop. So I say, before we start taxing people, Let's unlock the potential of our economy as it relates to being able to be you know, trading the, the resources that we have, uh, to bringing down the barriers that are holding back the, the, the GDP growth that we've talked about, uh, you know, and to, to, to bring about that competitiveness attitude. Say what you will about Donald Trump, and there's a lot that I'm sure we could all say. Uh, there's a lot more attention being paid to what businesses are saying. I saw the letter that my counterpart wrote to uh, Vice President Pence in terms of their recommendations on the economic recovery plan. Um, it's, it's, it's got the right elements to it, you know, and, and we compete, we compete with America. So we better realize that we can't just go out there and say we have just a climate crisis agenda. I believe in that, but that can't be our only agenda. We need to have a very competitive uh, response to this crisis. Otherwise, I think we're going to fall behind very quickly. And then you have real problems in the country, right? Because that's when your social programs, forget childcare, your healthcare, your education system gets cut. Uh, and then you start creating an anti-immigrant sentiment, an anti-trade sentiment. And somehow you end up with your own Donald Trump, which God forbid ever happens in this country. But don't think we're so special that it wouldn't in the wrong circumstances. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, well Thanks for the question, David. Um, we're, we're closing in um, on time here. Goldie, anything, what keeps you up at night? I mean, you're, you're listening, you do a lot of reading, you've got the politicians on one side, you've got your business leaders on the other side. What keeps you up these, these, these evenings in terms of what you're worried about or opportunities? The, the, short, the, the, the short answer, and, and let me just say, you won't find a prouder Canadian than I am. I, I love this country. I came here as a seven-year-old. My parents talk about having $28 in their pocket. You know, they put their, my brother and I through school and we've done well in society. We've advanced, you know, from where they were and we're doing the same for our children. I worry if Canada's up for it. I worry if, if we are, you know, um, we've just had it really too good too long. You know, 150 years where the British, you know, 75 years the British took care of us, 75 years the Americans took care of us. And, you know, we're a really comfortable place. You know, it's, a, it's a, the great debate is whether the Leafs are going to win the cup this year or, I mean, this is what we spend our time on. And the rest of the world is really hungry. It's really competitive. Like before this, I was like a guy who gets 100,000 miles on my <laughs> airplane within a quarter, you know, and so I've seen a lot of the world and I'm telling you, we're going to lose if we come out of this with our same old Canadian kind of, it's all okay. It's, you know, good enough is good enough. We'll be just fine. And, you know, we're doing so much better than in these other countries. The world doesn't care. The world doesn't discriminate uh, on whether you're nice. You got to compete. We got to compete. And, and, and a lot of what I say kind of, you know, it really pokes at people and I, and, I, and I don't want to do it to be mean. I'm doing it because I love the country. I think we can be stronger, better, uh, make life better for all of, of our society, whether it's, you know, it's indigenous groups, uh, people with special needs, mental health, women, men, uh, so, you know, like we can make life better for people in Canada. We have been in many ways our own worst enemy and holding it back and this crisis uh, I think is a, is a, is a call to action. Uh, it is an opportunity, you know, a tragic one, albeit with the loss of life and everything else. But if we really seize the moment here uh, to, to, to do the things that we have taken for advantage and taken for granted, I think that there's no stopping Canada. I think it is the greatest country in the world. I think that we should be ambitious. We should be hungry. We should be competitive. We should uh, unleash the potential of, of our people and get them off that sense of, you know, the government's got us and, you know, we're better than so-and-so. Let's strive to be the best that we can be. And, and I think that we can do that. But what keeps me up at night is whether we're up for it. And, and, I, and, I, and I really hope we are, because it would be tragic to have gone through what we've gone through and emerge at the other side and return to regularly scheduled programming. Yeah, no, that, those are wise, wise words. And very difficult to accomplish as well, right? Because Well, it takes leadership. And that's why I'm so happy to be here with all of you and, and have the job that I do, because I do think 
people can make a difference without necessarily having to put their name on a ballot. I think we need to speak up a lot more. And I think we also need to catch ourselves uh, as we play small ball and react to things one way or the other. I think we all need to do a better job of elevating the conversation and elevating the narrative uh, about what it, it will take to take Canada uh, from good to great. You know, what's the next level that we need to aspire to? Uh, that's a great summary. And it actually answers one of the follow-up questions here that was, what can we all be doing to help push the governments? And I think, uh, I think you, you answered that. I think we got to be more vocal in terms of and pushing our, our local MPs and the overall federal government in terms of what- That or run for office for any of you who are up for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a big question mark. We, we could use good people in it. More good people would be a good thing. Thanks for this, Leon. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for, for joining. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Goldie, on behalf of all of us uh, for a great session this, this morning. If you're interested in the Way Forward live webcast, please visit us at poleadership.com. You'll find a number of our recorded past webcasts. This one has been recorded. It will be posted as well. Our previous speakers have included a couple of our Harvard professors, Professor Rosabeth Cantor, Professor Michael Beer. We've had Professor Dennis Stein on, all recorded, so easy to access and to listen to. Next month, we've got two great leaders joining us, Joe Jackman, who many of you will know sort of sat, sits beside Joe Mimran a lot, you know, the PC brand, but he's been involved in a lot of the marketing and customer understanding down in the US. Uh, he'll be speaking with us about his new book. And then Professor Harry Kramer, who is the CEO of Baxter International, now a professor at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. He'll be talking with us on June 5th and uh, really looking forward to that, that conversation. It's called Your 168. There's 168 hours in a work week, in a week. So on that note, I wish you all a fantastic rest of the day and a safe weekend. And that concludes our session today. Hope to see you again soon.